Good morning, church family. I hope everybody's had a wonderful week and is enjoying this wild spring weather we're having. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's so nice to actually have a spring this year. So often we just jump straight from winter into summer, and uh, I am enjoying this. I hope you are too. I thought I would start today with sharing a little bit of what uh, we discussed at our last elder meeting this past week. It has become apparent here uh, that we do need to come up with a long-term solution for our church body to be able to get together and encourage one another. Uh, unfortunately, here in California, it looks like it could be quite some time before we're able to get together in the format that we're accustomed to getting together in. You know, what we'd all had hoped was going to be a very short um, quarantine shutdown type situation for our church is uh, shaping up based on what we're hearing right now that it's going to be quite some time before we're going to be able to meet in the manner in which we're accustomed to meeting. And it's interesting, but here in our country, you know, church is viewed as a big, white, tall building on the street corner with a cross out in front of it. Uh, we know that this has not always been the case. Uh, for starters, we know that the church is not a building, but it is us. We are the church. Those of us who proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we indeed are the church. And we also know that over the course of church history, the church has met in smaller groups. And we can go back 2,000 years and see this in the New Testament in the book of Acts, uh, where in chapter 2 we read that the early church broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And that's from chapter 2, verse 46. We also recall from the book of Acts in the church at Thyatira, and you might recall uh, the woman named Lydia and the church that met at her house. Uh, let's see here. And it's from uh, Acts chapter 16. And this was after Paul and Silas, uh, Acts chapter 16, I'm going to read verse 40 to you. Uh, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Again, they did not go to the big building on the street corner, but they went to Lydia's house. And even today, the church in many parts of the world meets in uh, much smaller groups, in particular in places where Christians are severely persecuted and in danger of being put to death. They meet in jam-packed basements and houses at 2 a.m. in the morning in a uh, darkened room in uh, hopes of uh, avoiding detection. While we aren't in this extreme of a circumstance here, obviously, we are at a point where it is best that we meet out of the public eye for the reasons that Dan noted in uh, his video a week ago that he shared with you. Uh, we do need to take, of course, seriously also just the danger and risk that this deadly virus does pose and the potential hazard of all of us meeting together in an enclosed room. So, going forward, what we're looking at doing, again, in the interest of having a longer-term situation, recognizing that this could go on for a while here, uh, we're planning to meet on Sunday mornings now in small groups. Uh, for those of you who are comfortable doing so, and of course exercising all the appropriate precautions, uh, we are working on the logistics of this, uh, but you should expect to hear more about this soon. And I know many of you are already doing this. Uh, in the meantime, I hope to see all of you next Saturday for our family picnic at Caldwell Park. Again, for those of you who are comfortable doing so, and of course, if you're, you know, if you're in good health and keeping in mind social distancing guidelines. Uh, that should be a ton of fun. I can't wait to see all of you. Uh, that's going to be great. And for today's message, I thought I would discuss with you the times we are living in, the great need for our testimony, and the beautiful book of John that we are now reading with our daily Bible reading that we're doing. And I am reminded of the men of Issachar uh, who were complimented for having an understa understanding of the times in which we are living. Uh, we are living in a world that's filled with selfish, selfish ambition, a hunger for power, darkness, and fear. We can just see it all around us right now during these times. And the actions being taken by governments far and wide also made me think of the religious leaders back during the time uh, when Jesus walked the earth. I recall his blasting of the Pharisees for their hypocrisy in Matthew 
chapter 23, you may recall he's, you know, saying, you know, woe to you, Pharisees, you teachers of the law. He says, refers to them as whitewashed tombs and the like. Uh, one of the things that he said to them was they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And just thinking about, you know, some of the restrictions that are going on uh, through government around the world at this time. And I saw an article in the newspaper this week that was entitled, Older Europeans Fight Call to Stay Home. Uh, there was a picture of a 70-year-old man and his two grandkids. And the grandkids were jumping up and down. It was just a beautiful picture, <laughs> just a beautiful thing. Uh, the man, he himself was wearing a mask and they're outside. And it just looked like they were just really having a, a great time together. And, um, you know, the, the caption underneath the picture said that, you know, hey, he opposes the government mandates that older people continue to, to, to stay home. After, and I, after seeing that wonderful picture, uh, I would have to say that if some travel was required for that get-together, for that man to get together with his grandchildren, I don't know about you, but I would put that in the essential category. And these times in which we're living in are also reminiscent of Luke uh, chapter 4, 16 through 19. Maybe not reminiscent of it, but it comes to mind with Jesus coming and his fulfillment of prophecy. And as we know, during his ministry, he would quite often go to the synagogues and uh, teach while he was on earth with us. And I'm looking at Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, which read, uh, Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, if you are a, amen, <laughs> amen, set the oppressed free <clears throat> and proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you too are so anointed, for we are all called to be ambassadors for Christ. And the people around you need you right now more than ever to be proclaiming freedom to them. And, you know, people are held captive by oppression, just with these uh, restrictions that are being placed on them in these days, and fear, fear of this deadly virus. And again, now more than ever, you know, people need to hear the good news that is Jesus Christ. Which brings us to the Gospel of John. Uh, when entered, and for me personally, when I'm introducing somebody to God's Word, this is where I go to first. Uh, why? Well, John, of course, is the apostle. Uh, he was the person who knew Jesus the best. And um, a friend of mine was asking me just a few, a few weeks ago, uh, actually, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Uh, instead of that, it's interesting, I asked somebody, a family member, not too long ago, uh, and invited him to go through the book of John. Not the first time I've asked him uh, to go through the scripture with me. And uh, he has so far, unfortunately, turned down my invitation uh, it's not like I'm inviting him to go get a root canal with me or anything like that, but who knows, some people have a re reluctance for whatever reason, and I'm working on getting to the bottom of that. Uh, but he said that he read the first three chapters, and he found it to be confusing. And I explained to him that, well, this is why it's important that we should go through it together. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking about the story, uh, again, from the book of Acts with Philip and the Ethiopian. And you know the story. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly paraphrase it for you from uh, Acts chapter 8. And uh, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Uh, the Spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And then after that, uh, later on, after he 
uh, we read that they go through the passage of Isaiah that he had been reading. <clears throat> then the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So again, we even see here uh, from the Bible, um, you know, what did he ask? You know, how can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? Well, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's where we come in. <clears throat> and a friend of mine recently asked me, how do I go about going through the book of John with someone? And let me tell you, it is not at all complicated. Uh, God's word speaks. <laughs> God's word speaks for itself. Uh, it does all the work. You just need to be faithful and just be there and just show up. Um, we are merely, you know, just facilitators. I, you know, I encourage people to, hey, don't tell people. Uh, don't try to teach it. Don't tell them. It's about them discovering God's word and its truth permeating their lives. We are merely facilitators to provide a little bit of background information where necessary or an explanation on occasion. <clears throat> but pretty much we need to remain silent and let the Holy Spirit do the work and that he will, for we know that the Lord's word does not return empty. Uh, let's go through, let's take a look at the book of John together. So if you don't already have your Bibles out, grab your Bible. Uh, let's turn to Luke, uh, Luke, John chapter 1. <clears throat> and I thought we'd just start at the beginning here and take a look at that. And I'll tell you, the beginning of the book of John can be the most complicated and the most difficult in many ways. Uh, John chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 are really, they're, they're kind of both a preview and a summary. And again, this is written, of course, by John the Apostle, who knew Jesus the best. And what he's done basically here, this is, uh, again, both a preview and a summary, but it's what John concluded, you know, it's the, a conclusion that he came to after spending about three years with Jesus. And everything after verse 18 is basically stories about Jesus' life. And so it's real simple. But here at this beginning part, uh, this first part can be perhaps the most confusing. And so we'll go ahead and look at that together. Just kind of as a backup plan, again, for people that might have the question, well, how do you go through it together? You know, a backup plan it can be just to always consider the questions of, you know, asking the person that you're meeting with, you know, what does it say? What does it mean? And then you can also approach it from the standpoint, you know, what are the implications for your life? Uh, so we're going to go through it together. Today's, uh, I should have the fireplace going on in the background here or something, but uh, this will be fun. This will be good. Uh, you know what? Before we do this, let's pray. <clears throat> uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for your wonderful word that we have <clears throat> and the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. And uh, Lord, I just uh, just pray that you would speak to us through your word, for your word is living and active, Lord, and sharper than a double-edged sword. And I just look forward to looking at this here right now. I always look forward to your word, Lord. And I just pray that you would move in our hearts and just draw us to our, uh, yourself, and that our hearts would be uh, like your heart, Lord, and our heart for others as well, that we just... Uh, Know your love and express your love to the world around us that's uh, going through such difficult times. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good. Uh, I'm going to read, and quite often what I do with people when we're looking at uh, the Word is uh, I'll have them read. You know, I won't read it. I'll have them read it because that's what's important is that people be reading God's Word. Uh, but since I don't have somebody here with me, you're stuck with me reading it here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. 
He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. <clears throat> the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Amen. <clears throat> and so what I would usually do is go through the passage, you know, just read small chunks at a time. Uh, and then we go back and look at it together in smaller bites. And, you know, these first two verses here, <laughs> you know, we've, we've read them so many times. Uh, many of us can just recite them from memory here. But in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And, you know, good starting point with somebody as well. Uh, you know, who or what is the Word at this point? And we know it's interesting that the Word is capitalized, of course. And we know from verse 14 that the Word became flesh. And uh, uh, basically who we're talking about here is Jesus Christ, of course. And, um, and actually, I mean, we've looked at this so many times, we've come to know that, oh yeah, of course, talking about Jesus. Well, consider if you've read this for the first time, where in here does it say that, oh, the Word is Jesus? Does it say that? No, <laughs> it really doesn't. You have to do some digging and some kind of reading through it. Actually, it does say it, but it isn't until much later. And you have to kind of connect the dots. Um, so if you ask somebody, they still could potentially not know who the Word is. Uh, if they figured it out, fantastic. But you might need to do a little detective work in looking at it. And here's where I think we can get some clues. And again, it's so hard for us who are so familiar with Scripture to try to look at it through a clean lens as if we're looking at it and reading it for the first time. Uh, what I would refer to here is look at verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here's really our first and only yep, reference here specifically to Jesus Christ in these first 18 verses. And uh, so how do we conclude then that the word is Jesus? Well, here we say, you know, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We have to back up here to verse uh, 14, where, uh, you know, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So hey, grace and truth here, we know is Jesus, the reference to and uh, we see, you know, the Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only. He came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we can connect the dots and see this, that this is Jesus that we're referring to. And again, some people might pick up on that immediately very quickly. Others may not. You might need to do a little detective work with them and examine Scripture to uh, figure that out. So what if we look at those first two verses now, and instead of saying the Word... Uh, what if we substitute Jesus? I'm going to ditch my shirt here. Bear with me one second. So in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning. I think that helps our comprehension a little bit here, and it helps simplify things as well. So what do we learn about Jesus just from these first two verses? There's so much to learn here. One thing I might add is if you're going through this for the first time with somebody, uh, you know, you might just call it quits after verse 18. That might be plenty to accomplish in the first day. It's not a race. You don't want to try to bite off too much because you really want uh, the, to go, it's better to go through a smaller amount of material and have it sink in than to cover too much. So what do we learn about Jesus then when we substitute Jesus on those first two words? Uh, 
he was there at the beginning. He was with God, and Jesus was God. Uh, he was with God in the beginning. So, so often uh, somebody starting off might just think that Jesus was only on earth, you know, hey, for a short period of time. But we know that he is and was and is to come and is indeed our living God and Savior. What else do we, uh, what do we learn him about, about Jesus in verse 3? And this could be completely new again to whoever it is that you're meeting with. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And you can, a can ask, you know, hey, is this new to you? Are you aware of that? And it's just kind of an opportunity for uh, discovery, really. Uh, another thing that's good to look at is just words that recur numerous times. And you could ask uh, somebody, you know, hey, what word do you see that appears quite often in these uh, first, uh, however many verses here, 10 verses or so? Uh, I've circled it in my Bible so it pops out, but light. We see light. I know that uh, Weston has talked a little bit about this, but we can talk about the significance of light. You know, why do you suppose Jesus is referred to as the light? And you can go through and examine some of the specific references to light just to try to, again, deepen our understanding because, again, we're, we're digging into the spiritual. Um, and that's uh, just so important to kind of, again, dig a little deeper. And uh, we can also look then at verse 10. It was interesting, you know. Uh, you know, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. You could potentially ask somebody, you know, hey, why do you suppose that is? And you know what? You may not answer all of the questions at this point in time. And uh, sometimes it's good to say, hey, well, let's see as we get further into this, let's see if we can, we might find the answer to some of these questions. Don't feel like everything has to be answered right now. The other thing, too, I should add is, of course, we don't have all the answers, right? <laughs> we look at Scripture and there's a lot of things that are confusing to us. Uh, it's not ours to know. Uh, but the things that we do, what is it? I think it was W.C. Fields uh, that said something along the lines of, uh, and apparently this is, I don't know if this one was from his, uh, no, I'm thinking about a different time, but I think it might have been W.C. Fields that said it's, or maybe it was Mark Twain that said, it's not the things of Scripture that I don't understand that bother me, it's the things that I do understand, for we are convicted of sin, are we not? Uh, how about verse 12? Uh, verse 12 is a great verse for us all to know and a great verse for somebody to discover. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So this is where you can just you know go forward and ask the person. So how does somebody become a child of God? What do they have to do? Uh, we know that it's simply by faith and not by works. We see that already right off the bat here in Scripture. How about the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, what do you, that's a good thing, again, to ask somebody, well, what, what does it mean by that? Again, looking at the questions, you know, what does it mean, or what does it say, what does it mean? And then, of course, how can you apply it, or what are the implications of that? And so we know that the Word, Jesus, became flesh. So he came and made his dwelling among us. And here, again, it's helpful to substitute Jesus for the word just to really simplify it and to bring it home a little better. You might talk about grace and truth. You know, hey, what is grace? How would you define grace? And what is, uh, what is grace to you? Here's something that's very important here on uh, verse 15. Now, I'm actually backing up to the 6. I missed this here. You know, there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. Well, people are going to get confused because, of course, we have two Johns here, right? We have John the Apostle who wrote this, and we have John the Baptist who we're going to be reading about initially to start off in the book of John. So that's something that you just will need to explain for people and differentiate that, hey, this John that we're talking about here is not the author John. It's not the Apostle and Disciple of Christ uh, John. And what else do we want to tackle? That's... Um, Oh, this is good. Uh, how about verse 15? That's right. We're looking at that in a reference again to John the Baptist. You know, John testifies concerning him. He, he cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. 
you know, again, somebody reading that for the first time without really pondering it and stopping to pause is liable to be confused. They might even stop and ponder it and still be confused. So if you go through that, that would be good to ask them, you know, what does, uh, what does John mean by that? What is, um, and why would John the Baptist say that? And that's good, again, where you can explain. It's like, well, no, hey, we know that he was with God from the beginning and he created all things. And so even though he comes after me, he has surpassed me because he was before me. Hey, he's creator. He is God himself, himself being Jesus Christ. Uh, then we get it back again into, uh, you know, grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only. And we know that the glory of the one and only was referenced earlier. Again, we know that that's Jesus. So if we substitute Jesus again in there, uh, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but Jesus, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And so that can be a good question potentially to ask somebody, you know, why do you suppose Jesus came? And it uh, looks like perhaps he came in part to make God the Father known. For God's an invisible God. Uh, we don't see him readily. We see him through what he has made, of, of course, and we've seen him move in our lives. Uh, but it's not like, oh, gee, I can, you know, I can see the a person, I can see a thing. But um, that's a, just an interesting thing also just to take a look at and to consider. And again, that's probably as much as uh, you might want to cover with somebody first time out of the gate. And again, this isn't rocket science. Um, you know, hey, it's great to have a deep understanding of a lot of the things in the Bible and history and all that, but really ultimately, uh, what is it? Uh, apart without love, we're just a clanging gong, right? And so uh, we have a world around us, again, that so needs us. Um, I have a friend that I'm currently meeting with on a weekly basis, and we're going through the book of John. I think we're on about John chapter 7 right now. And uh, we've been doing Zoom meeting in light of all this uh, quarantine business. And after our meeting the other day, we met again on Friday morning, I was struck yet again with just the realization of what a blessing it is to be walking somebody through God's Word and just seeing their discovery process. Uh, you know, really, I think I'm possibly more blessed than the person that, you know, I'm going through God's word with. It's just uh, so encouraging. You know, if you're not experiencing this, uh, you're missing out. And I just uh, encourage you to uh, consider, uh, you know, who there might be that uh, you can introduce to God's word. So I'm going to wrap up right here, and I'm going to wrap up with my prayer for you which is from the book of Philemon, verse 6. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Amen. Uh, Lord bless you all. I miss you. Uh, hope to see you next Saturday. Take care.